A common task in the IELTS listening test is a matching question. There are two types of matching questions, and in this video, we're going to look at strategies for both and apply them to a few practice questions. So here is the first type of matching question. And as we can see, there are more options than questions, meaning you won't use all the answer options. As you can see for this question, there are six options, but only four questions, so you won't use all of the options. There will be two left over. We'll come back to questions one through four soon and listen to the audio in order to answer the questions. But before we do, let's take a quick look at the other type of matching question. So here's an example of the second type of matching question. And as we can see, there are just three options, A, B, or C. Because there are only five questions, you will need to use some options more than once. Just like the first set of matching questions we saw, we will come back to these sample questions and have a go at answering them. First, let's look at a way to approach both types of matching question. In the listening test, you get time to prepare before listening to each part. It is important to really, really make good use of this time. Read ahead and form an idea of what sort of information you need to listen out for. There are five key steps to doing this. Let's look at these steps one at a time. Step one, read the instructions. It is important to know if you can use a letter more than once. Step two, read the questions. Step three, underline or highlight the key words. This further focuses you on the information that you need to listen out for. Step four, think of synonyms and parallel expressions. We'll look at this technique as we do our sample questions together. Step five, listen while looking. Maximize your potential to perceive by focusing your eyes on the keywords in the questions while listening out for the information that matches. The words will most likely be different, but the meaning will be the same. Okay, let's start with the first sample matching question, which is about the wedding venues. Okay, step one, read the instructions. They say, Choose the answers from the box and write the correct answers A through F next to questions one through four. So we have to choose four answers from six options. It doesn't say that we can use a letter twice. Once we have chosen an answer, we can eliminate it from our choices for the remaining questions. Now let's move on to step two. Read the questions. One can cater for different dietary requirements. Two, offers accommodation. Three, is only available in the summer. Four, provides vehicles. Now step three, underline or highlight the key words. For question one, we can highlight dietary requirements. For question two, we can highlight accommodation. For question three, we can highlight summer. And for question four, we can highlight vehicles. Now, step four, think of synonyms and parallel expressions. What are some other words or phrases that might be used to give this information? Let's note down some ideas. Information about dietary requirements might include words such as vegetarian, vegan, or dairy-free. Instead of accommodation, the audio might mention rooms or stay. Instead of summer, we might hear something about warmer months or season. A synonym for vehicles might be transport, or a type of transport such as a car or van. Even if you don't predict the right answer, this process is leading you to be open to different possibilities. Okay, we're ready to listen. Step five, listen while looking. Keep looking at the options so you are ready for the information when it comes. Listen to the audio and choose your answers. You will hear the answers in the same order as the questions. Your job is to choose the right letter. Ready? The audio starts now. Good afternoon. How can I help? Hi. We're looking for a wedding reception venue in the area. I was wondering if you had any information about the options available. Absolutely. 
This is a very popular area for weddings because it's close to the city and has such beautiful landscapes. There are six main venues. Would you like me to give you a quick rundown? That would be great. Thank you. If you're looking for a larger venue that can cater for more than 100 guests, there are three available. Williamson Manor, Scott House, and Pacific View. They are all beautiful properties with full restaurants offering a wide range of choices. Williamson Manor specializes in medieval themed spit roasts. Scott House features a very good range of gluten-free options, while Pacific View is famous for its extensive range of seafood. Do any of them have rooms available for guests to stay over? Pacific View used to offer a honeymoon suite with a spectacular view of the coastline, but unfortunately they suffered considerable damage in the recent storms and that is not available at the moment. Williamson Manor has six double suites available for use by members of the bridal party, but of course there's an additional charge. I see. There are going to be about 40 guests, so those places might be a little too large for us. What are the other options? There's the Chateau, the Rustley, and Ascot on the Park. The Chateau is closed over winter, spring, and autumn. Both the Rustley and Ascot on the Park are smaller, more intimate venues suitable for up to 50 guests. Would you like to hear about what they provide? Yes, please. It sounds as if they are about the size that we're looking for. Okay. The Rustley has a traditional garden with water features, outdoor dining options, and a swimming pool. Just looking for any information we have about Ascot on the Park. Ah, here it is. I'll read it out. Ascot on the Park is a beautiful function venue centered around refurbished 19th century stables. Traditional horse-drawn carriages to convey the wedding party to the delightfully quaint Summer House Wedding Chapel are provided free of charge to all wedding groups. That sounds rather nice. I think that sounds like us. I'll have to talk it over with my fiancé, of course. Thank you very much. You have been very helpful. You are very welcome. Best wishes for the big day. How did you go? Let's take a look at each question and answer. The answer to question one, which wedding venue can cater for different dietary requirements, was option B, Scott House. The speaker didn't mention dietary requirements using those words. Let's see what he did say. Scott House features a very good range of gluten-free options, while Pacific View is famous for its extensive range of seafood. Gluten-free is a type of special dietary requirement. Although we hadn't predicted exactly that answer, the fact that we had considered dairy-free as the option alerted us to the possibility of an answer like this. Question two asked which wedding venue offers accommodation. In fact, accommodation was mentioned in connection to two of the other venues. Let's listen again to that part of the recording. Pacific View used to offer a honeymoon suite with a spectacular view of the coastline, but unfortunately they suffered considerable damage in the recent storms and that is not available at the moment. Williamson Manor has six double suites available for use by members of the bridal party, but of course there's an additional charge. Note the use of the phrase used to, meaning that the honeymoon suite was available in the past, but isn't now. The word not is also used to indicate that Pacific View, option F, is not the correct answer. This is a common feature of IELTS listening. The test wants to make sure that you are understanding the spoken text completely, not just listening out for familiar words. Consequently, distractors with phrases like used to or is planned to are often used. What may initially appear as a correct answer because of the inclusion of appropriate vocabulary is actually not the correct answer. Further information identifies the correct option. Notice how the words in the answer options hardly ever appear in the audio text. The answers come in the form of synonyms and paraphrases. The next question asked, which wedding venue is only available in the summer? While summer is the key word in the question, the answer comes in this case with the inclusion of an antonym, a word with the opposite meaning presented in a negative context. 
Let's listen again. The chateau is closed over winter, spring, and autumn. Did you hear the antonym? See how an antonym can be used to provide the information to answer the question. The answer is option A, the chateau. All right, one more question to check. Number four, which wedding venue provides vehicles? The audio mentioned a particular type of vehicle, not one that we had anticipated, but because we were listening for a vehicle type, we had a good chance of identifying the correct information. Here's the audio. Ascot on the Park is a beautiful function venue centered around refurbished 19th century stables. Traditional horse-drawn carriages to convey the wedding party to the delightfully quaint summer house wedding chapel are provided free of charge to all wedding groups. Again, this is a common way that the information that you need to answer the question is presented. While the question includes a general term such as vehicle, the audio mentions a more specific word, a type of vehicle, in this case, horse-drawn carriage. Okay, we're beginning to see and understand one of the main characteristics of this type of listening task. We need to focus on the key words in the question in order to be ready to hear the appropriate information. However, the audio doesn't use the same words. We need to be listening out for synonyms and paraphrases. The listening test, after all, is assessing our comprehension of what we hear. Before we try another practice task, here's a reminder of the steps we use before and during the test. Step one, read the instructions. Step two, read the questions. Step three, underline or highlight key words. Step four, think of synonyms and parallel expressions. And step five, listen while looking. Let's have a go at another practice question. Feel free to pause the video now and take 30 seconds to read the questions. Okay, now try listening to the audio and answer the questions. Hi Paul, sit down, what can I do for you? I'm trying to decide which papers to choose for next year and there is really not much information about them. I know the papers that I need to do but I'm not sure which other ones would be best. Can you give me some help? Perhaps, I'll try. What subject are you majoring in? I'm hoping to have a double major in English and History, so I have selected the compulsory papers for that. There is a course called Renaissance Poetry and Prose, which I have to do at some stage, but I'm really not very keen. It sounds a bit dull, to be honest. I like modern writing. I find the older stuff pretty hard going. It's taught by Professor Jackman. He's a great teacher. He really brings the material to life. He's very funny, and he makes even the most difficult writers seem relevant. Also, you have to do that course and the teacher might change. I'd get in and do it next year. What other courses are you looking at? I thought Australian literature sounded like it could be interesting, but I wonder if it might be a bit too specific and that a more general course might be more useful. I understand what you're saying. That is a new course this year, and I don't know anything about it, I'm afraid. I suppose it might be quite interesting. I can't really advise you on that one, I'm sorry. What about contemporary American thought and writing? It sounds much more like my sort of thing than Renaissance poetry and prose. It counts as either an English paper or a history paper, so it gives you more options further down the track. Go for it. What else? Well, my friends have been raving about this course called Biology and Man, which they've been taking this year. It sounds really fascinating. They recommended it to me. It might be fascinating, but it's not a good choice for you. You can't choose courses just on friends' recommendations. They're not majoring in English and history, are they? True. You're probably going to advise me against my other choice. It's a philosophy paper called Introduction to Logic. That's getting too far away from my core studies too, I guess. Not at all. That would be an excellent choice. A grounding in philosophy will help you in the years to come. Really? That's great. It's been really helpful to get your input. Thanks heaps. You're welcome, Paul. How was that? You would have heard that the answers expressed the idea of Mary either recommending or advising against each course but different spoken expressions were used. Let's listen again to the relevant part of the audio for each question. As we know, the information for the answers comes in the same order as the questions. Here's where we get the information for question 21. I'm hoping to have a double major in English and history, so I have selected the compulsory papers for that. There is a course called Renaissance Poetry and Prose, which I have to do at some stage, but I'm really not very keen. It sounds a bit dull, to be honest. I like modern writing. 
I find the older stuff pretty hard going. It's taught by Professor Jackman. He's a great teacher. He really brings the material to life. He's very funny, and he makes even the most difficult writers seem relevant. Also, you have to do that course and the teacher might change. I'd get in and do it next year. What other courses are you looking at? Notice how the course name, Renaissance Poetry and Prose, is only mentioned once. After that, it's referred to as it or that course. This is a common practice in IELTS listening. It tests your ability to follow a passage and understand the use of referring pronouns. Mary doesn't specifically say, I recommend the course. She says, I'd get in and do it next year. Short for, I would get in and do it next year if I were you. This use of I'd is a common way of recommending. The answer here is A. Ideally, while you were reading the question and preparing to listen, you were thinking of different phrases that Mary might use to express recommendation and dissuasion, advising against a particular choice. Let's listen for the information for the next question. Does she recommend the course in Australian literature? I thought Australian literature sounded like it could be interesting, but I wonder if it might be a bit too specific and that a more general course might be more useful. I understand what you're saying. That is a new course this year, and I don't know anything about it, I'm afraid. I suppose it might be quite interesting. I can't really advise you on that one. I'm sorry. So, Mary says that she doesn't know anything about the course and that she can't really advise him. So the answer is C. She neither recommends nor advises against the course. Notice how again the course name is only mentioned once. So you have to listen carefully to connect the referring words such as it, that, and that one. Let's listen for the next two answers. Again, Mary uses another expression to recommend contemporary American thought and writing. She says, go for it, as a way of recommending the course. So the answer to question 23 is A. Question 24 is B. She advises against biology and man by saying, it's not a good choice for you. Let's listen and read again for those. What about contemporary American thought and writing? It sounds much more like my sort of thing than Renaissance poetry and prose. It counts as either an English paper or a history paper, so it gives you more options further down the track. Go for it. What else? Well, my friends have been raving about this course called Biology and Man, which they've been taking this year. It sounds really fascinating. They recommended it to me. It might be fascinating, but it's not a good choice for you. You can't choose courses just on friends' recommendations. They're not majoring in English and history, are they? Okay, I think we're getting the hang of this. We're listening for meaning, not repetition of words. You probably noticed that the words recommended and recommendations were used in that part of the audio. These were distractors, aiming to catch you out. They were discussing Paul's friend's recommendation, not Mary's. When a word from the question appears in the audio, it might be a distractor. Okay, one last question to check. Number 25. Let's listen again. True. You're probably going to advise me against my other choice. It's a philosophy paper called Introduction to Logic. That's getting too far away from my core studies too, I guess. Not at all. That would be an excellent choice. A grounding in philosophy will help you in the years to come. Did you notice the distractor? There it is. In this case, the distractor comes from Paul, but it is contradicted by Mary saying, not at all, meaning that the answer is A. She recommends the course rather than B. She advises against the course. A lot of questions in this video had distractors. Remember to watch out for these in all IELTS listening tasks on test day. Being aware that distractors may pop up will help you stay focused and find the correct answer. It can be challenging, but you can do it. One final tip, don't ever leave an answer blank. If you don't write anything, you can't get the question right. If you don't know, one lucky guess can be enough to lift your result by half a band score. Thanks for watching and good luck with your preparation.